Oh, uh, you're good. Okay, no obstructed seat view. Okay, we got people up there. You got this is like Fenway Pack. Okay, you guys are right field. You go center field bleachers. Okay, you're right over third base. Right third base. <coughs> okay, go. All right, enjoy. Here, did you bring the uh, speed gun? <laughs> I did. I did sit in Chicago once in Wrigley Park next to the speed gun. But you're here to talk about my containers and all this stuff. All right, I am Bob Wrestling. I am going to talk about the pain and agony in grueling detail of making a container. I'm not going to build containers. Part of your slides. I'm going to go over uh, what if, how many people here work with containers. Okay, so I'm probably going to bore half of you. Okay, but if I can become boring, just put up the you're boring me signal, which is all right, and I'll come on boring magically. Uh, then I'm going to go through the pain and agony. Then I'm going to take a little bit of a pivot. Um, and how many people like jobs? How many jobs? How many people like jobs? Can't waste the time because you're around the gym. Okay, so we're good. We're in a good space. It's a good act. He's a hard act to follow, but he's a good act to follow. So, um, and then, so I'm going to talk about, uh, let me give containers 101 for those people that never go over the street. We're real clear about containers. Then I'm going to go through my uh, my pain and agony in grueling detail. In grueling detail. And then uh, I'm going to take a little, I'm going to talk about the big picture of things. The big picture of things. So, um, before, uh, I go on a little bit about me. I'm Bob Russell, and I've been developing since uh, 1987. I'm a technology writer. I write for a lot of places. Uh, I work for a number of companies in LA. Uh, right now, I'm the publisher of The World in Which We Live Cartoon. Feel free to go there, get on the list, and send you a cartoon every Monday or whatever. We generally we publish on Mondays, but we sometimes we have a special edition. Uh, I, I'll be upfront with you. Um, I came into software in 1987. At that time, it was my second daughter was born in 87, so I must have been a whole old 32, which in developer years at the age of 32 back in 70. That was still all right, but here we're you know old guy. I'm an old, a 32 year old guy, and uh, at that time uh, I was a teacher, and somebody said here uh, I was a, a teacher and I was a music teacher, and so and one of the problems that musicians had in uh, or composers in particular is getting your music played is very hard. It's very hard to you write string quartets or symphonies or like that. To hear what you're writing is very hard. And somebody said, here, by the way, here's this thing called MIDI, and here's a computer, and you can write string quartets to your heart's delight, and you can hear them. It's not like an exact string quartet, but pretty close. And that's what I did. And I said, you know, I can write music on this thing. Maybe I can figure out how to code. And I did. And I did. And I've been very fortunate that my coding skills are pretty good. Uh, they still are, even though we know after we develop. How many people here are over 40? Okay, you're living on borrowed time. All right, that's okay, because we know what happens to people like us after 40, but we're still here to talk about it. And so I do, and I'm fortunate to talk about it. So here I am, and I love tech. I do. I love tech. I get up in the morning, I love tech. I get up at night, I love tech. And, um, but I'm very aware of what we do. Very aware of what we do. So anyway, that's it. I don't have a fancy clicker, so there's going to be a lot of walking back and forth action. All right. So this is oh, what a container is. Okay, a VM. First, you had in the beginning, back when Noah was filling in the ark, you had a computer. The computer had your RAM, and it had your storage, and it had your CPU. Okay, and the CPU did the thinking, and the uh, RAM was the place you could think. Yeah, the RAM was the, the, you know, the whiteboard, and storage was the file cabinet. Everybody here knows that. But what would happen is, like, I don't know, but my wife, what she does is she goes out and just bought a nice Mac 2, Mac, Mac Pro with an SSD drive and 16 gigabytes of RAM so she can go and do recipes on the internet. Right? That's her, that's what she does, right? I'm envious about that new machine. But we found out that a lot of hardware is being underutilized, right? A lot of hardware, she got all this RAM. So people come and say, well, what we'll do is we'll create something called a virtual machine. And what the virtual machine is will make a virtual, an idea, a software idea of a computer and allow it, a com allow it to run on a computer. So if you have a computer, let's say, with, uh, let's be industrial here and say, we have a computer with 12 um, terabytes of storage, <coughs> and we'll say, I'm doing, making this math off my head, what's a good number to buy? 36 gigabytes of RAM and, uh, some, uh, and, and four CPUs. What we'll do is we'll make a virtual machine with one CPU, three gigabytes of RAM, and some storage. And that would you put three machines on and completely utilize the uh, capabilities of that single hardware box with a virtual machine. The 
drawback is, is once that VM owns that RAM, owns that CPU, owns that storage, it's not giving it back. It's not giving it back. And again, I'm telling you, those of you that have been containerized, I'm just telling you stuff you know. So uh, along comes this thing and say, well, look, maybe we have another way. And I'll be honest with you, I, I mean, I, half this stuff is magic. Half this, maybe three quarters of this stuff is magic. But somebody comes along and says, what if I were to tell you that you could have the benefits of a virtual machine and still have dynamic resource allocation? Would that interest you? Right? And I say, yeah, that would interest me. So we have this thing called the container. It's been around for a while. They're called Linux uh, isolated processes or something. And what you can do is create this isolated process that will give you the benefits of a virtual machine and will also take away the static, the dynamic, static allocation built into virtual machines. I said, sign me up. And not only that, but because I'm, I live in, you know, if anybody here has read Doonesbury, uh, going back, Doonesbury, um, what happens is that uh, Bernie, Bernie who owned the computer shop, one day he goes to lunch and he comes back and he's out of business. So for me, it's like I live in this tray that one day I'll wake up, they'll need this technology I didn't learn, and I'll be old. Well, wait. Anyway, I will be old, so I, I've been clear about that. So in containers work is you have your source code, and you have this thing called the Docker file, which describes your source code and stuff you need. And then you do a Docker build, and it builds what's called an image. And an image is a template for your container for your container. And then you do what's called Docker run. And there are different flavors of containerization technologies. <coughs> this I'm looking at Docker, and you do Docker run, and Docker run will automatically look at that image, that template of the container, whether it be out on Docker Hub or someplace, and it automatically just inject it into your hardware. And there you go. It's easy, right? And it's so easy that any of you that start, I don't know about you, I start, this is how hard can it be? So I go out and I go to Docker someplace and there was this thing, you just go to Docker virtual machine, you write hello world, run hello world something, and I get this, this container that says hello world. And I think, look at me, I've mastered container technology, right? I've mastered it, I'm just taking it up, but I'm not that delusional yet. So I said, well, why don't I do something a little more complex than Hello World? And so I decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a, a microservice. Microservice is called a range. And the IBM guy did a really good job talking about microservices. They're not for everybody. But this one was, and this is a very small microservice. It's somewhat trivial. But what the service does is you call this a, a API, this uh, URL endpoint, and you give it some bits. And what it'll do is it'll transform that those bits into a thumbnail. That's all. That's all it does. My little microservice. But I figure if I can do the low world, how hard can it be? Right, now, I have a question because I want to get this. This is a small group. How many people have, just so I don't feel so lonely because I suffer from loneliness, how many people have like, tried a new technology said to yourself, how hard can it be? And three days later, you're like semi homicidal. Ah, amen, brothers. Amen, brothers and sisters. All right, amen, brother. So this is the prerequisite to what it means. You are not alone. And only that, I'm going to get up here and tell you. So, all right, so here's the deal. So I made a Node.js app. I ran Node because I'm intrigued by Node and JavaScript. You know, that, you know, so, you know here's the deal. So back in 1987, I'm doing like this procedural programming, you know, in something like basic or something, procedural programming. And somebody says, you know, real programmers write strong type languages, right? Real programmers write strong type languages. I said, well, you're not going to learn a strong type language. So I, I picked up C, and I made the strong types, and, and then the compilers blew up, right? When you got type mismatches, you know, I thought, I'm somebody. You know, I've grown up. Because, again, I came in when I was 32, so I already felt inadequate because I was just over the hill by nature. Right? And then, so you do this, and then, you know, 20 years later, what are we back to now? Granted, I don't know, I forget a lot, but I do know that in JavaScript, I can make any type I want, any time I want, right? So it's sort of poetically telling that all the stuff we, we judged our competency on 20 years ago now is completely irrelevant. But that's not what I'm going to talk to you about today. What I'm talking about, so I got this Node.js, and I use it in image magic. And what this means is that the way Node works, there's a Node uh, package that will, if ImageMagic is installed on the, on the machine, it will automatically 
perfect image matching and make it bootable and do the tr transformations for it. So again, real simple. I've got a Node.js app that's sitting there out on the wage, TTP, takes the bits, pulls it in, pulls up some wrapper for image magic, gives some node image magic wrapper, makes the bits little, and sends them back out, right? How hard can it be? Right? How hard can it be? So, so here's my little flow chart here, because I think I want to be a professional computer programmer, you know, when I grow up. And it goes here, so I get the request, save the bytes to a file, and then I get the bytes from disk and thumb disks and some save the thumbnail bytes to a file, and I take the file and export it. Now, those of you in the know should already be throwing things at me. Hang tight. Hang tight. Don't worry. Don't worry. It will get better. So there's my little flow chart and all that good stuff. And then so, you know, I whip up my, this is my Docker. How many people, this is, I, to be honest, I, I forget names. I, my name is Bob Resselman. I'm a programmer anyway. But they, they ship, Docker ships with a motor magical tool that will kick you into the Docker VM. I don't want to whip out my computer. Remember, remember, remember what this is called? It's like the Docker application. I'll tell you the end. If you really want to go, it ships for free. You can download it. You can put it on your Mac and go, and you just type in Docker Start. You, you got the VM. So this is my workspace here. There's my, you know, my web projects there. And I can do all my Docker work inside this VM. It's getting good, right? Things are working. Things are working really well. And so I do my Docker. I've got right my Docker file, and I do my build. And um, <coughs> so I got build, so I got my now the way Docker works for those of you know is that when you run Docker build it looks for the Docker file and, and it looks for a Docker file and it will do the build off the Docker file and it'll change it in magically to your image. Your image. Looking good. Now the other thing is Fess up to you, I'm typing impaired, I'm the world's worst typist. I've said, I've put, I've said a lot of knots as no's, N-O-W's, a lot of N-O-W's as knots and got me in trouble. So I really have to be aware, particularly when you're sending out an assignment for an editor. Anyway, so I'm a bad typist, so I'll give you that. But I type that, and this is what comes back. <sighs> okay, now, build requires one part of one argument, and other argument, what will we do? You got one option, and one argument. How about this? That's an option? No, that's an option. Shows you what I did. Shows you what I did. So here it is in the dark of night, sitting here, language impaired, typing impaired, some guy that just wants to get a container running because it work on a low world, how hard can it be, right? I'm struggling. I'm strugg struggling here. And now, like anybody else, I go to Google, I look at this stuff, I look at this stuff, I look at this stuff, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading. Now, the other thing is, as you can probably tell, I tend to move a little faster than I should. And it turns out, Take a big picture and make it into a little picture. 
take a big picture and make it into a little picture. It's not to store data, it's not to retrieve data, it's to take a big picture and make it into a little picture. So this right here was very bad business. And I know you knew that. I know there were about 15 of you in here saying, Bob, you don't. Why are you saving the DSA? You're creating, you're requiring another resource, and by the way, you just slowed your app down by a factor or something. So bad business. So I read it. I went back to the drawing board. I learned. I didn't try to do a good job. I really like that job. And I did. Okay. So I saved it. I saved the bytes to a memory buffer. I get the bytes from a memory buffer. I take those bytes. I make the thumbnail. Then I send it. Never touch it. That's all I do. Okay. So here it is. And so this is my Docker. My Docker file. Okay, what it does here is it runs, it gets it right, it makes sure I get the right, if I create a Ubuntu, and I update my Ubuntu there, I install Node, and then I install Image Magic, and I clean some stuff, and I copy the package JSON over the source, and then I do an npm install, which is, you know, that you probably, guys probably know much more about what I do. Uh, it makes, uh, does the Node install, and then I go to service, my working directory, and I start my npm, and my app starts. And I get this. You want to continue, yes, no, and then this happens. And I'm going, damn. Now, this is all, now granted, did you, what's your name, sir? Adrian. Adrian, Adrian has probably figured out already why I'm a dope, but it's already, it's two, in the, you know, it's two in the morning, and all I want to do is make my little microservice going, and you know, come on, man, it's containers, it's supposed to be easy. No, I'm not a sysadmin in real life. No, I don't play one on TV. I'm just a guy that's trying to learn a technology. Just a guy that's trying to learn a technology and a poor type is to death. I've come to accept myself. And so at this point, I'm going, holy jeepers. Do I have to go into image magic? Do I have to start looking for libraries? Where? What could be going wrong? I mean, how, I don't know about you, but for me, it could be anything. And I've had episodes in my life where, you know, it was some case insensitivity, I had the wrong version of the library. It could be anything. And you got I accept that. So I'm saying to myself, if it's anything, I gotta do the work and figure out what anything is. So we're not talking here five minutes, you're already an hour for me to get the dot. Right? An hour for me to get the dot. And now I gotta go and figure this thing out. Four hours of me and Google and my best friend. Four hours. Granted, I'm impaired. Four. And my wife had already seen it get Like, I can't sleep. How many people got, how many people had a problem and can't sleep at night? Uh, all right. Those of you that doesn't bother you, tell, tell me the secret. Right, but I'm worried about it. My whole major why, how could I be so incompetent, right? If I was a real programmer, I'd be able to do this. If I was a real developer, I'd be able to do this. Forget that I have a million users of some other app I wrote out there somehow. That doesn't make me, because a real developer would know how to fix this problem. And since I'm four hours into it, obviously I'm not a real developer. Running and I'm reading the command lines when they were going by, and the question was saying, if I was doing this automatically by hand, you would come to a point where it says, do you want to do this, yes or no? And because I, for whatever reason, you know, poor typist, inattentive, not paying attention to detail, which I sort of brought myself on, I didn't put the Y there, I got this message that's saying, do you want to continue any other stuff the other stuff that came underneath it, the image magic garbage, was irrelevant. It was just irrelevant because I didn't know enough to put the Y in just to tell it to go keep going forward.
Anybody see this one before? Any node hits? I didn't. Yeah, it's a little bit different. It's called Typically, this, no, in my limited experience, no joke, this indicates that there's something wrong in the file. It, there's something wrong with the file, or something in the file system. Uh, in Node, when I run Node, and if I can't find the file, I'll kick off that error. But that's what I got. That's all I got. It's spawn, convert, no way. So I do like any other developer trying to imitate something confident. I put it into Google, and I go everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere, spawn. Do I have to redo the file? Is the file system working right? No, no, oh, all these nights. Anybody like had this question in moment? Like, why am I here? Or I'm the only one, right? No, you can say I'm the only one. That's right. Well, dudes, we are so cool. If you were real, it's you. Remember when you were dating? It's not you. It's not you. It's me. <coughs> This is sleepless night. This is sleepless night. So I get up next day and I figure, what, what do I have to lose? I restart the machine. I just restart the machine. Guess what? Now, John says, that, now, John says, wait a minute. You know, this is very, I've been reflecting on this talk. This talk was very good. I shouldn't have let this go. I mean, obviously, something terrible. I'm going to blow up the Columbia spaceship. You know, I don't get this going. And this is serious. But that's what it was. There was just something that I had to restart the machine. I had to restart the machine. It was that simple. Or it wasn't. Because nothing told me, we better take a look at restarting the machine. All right, so now we're two days in. This is two days. And so this is what actually, it worked. Work. I put in a big picture, I make a big electric case. Uh, I do, and this is a picture of my electric case, a small one, fretless, mahogany, or walnut, uh, Spanish cedar, applied fretboard, or something. all that good stuff. But it worked. It did work. At last. Now we did it. Now we did it. But it got me to think. Okay, it got me to think. All right, I sort of got containers, it sort of worked for me, I get it. What I'm not getting is why any of this stuff matters. Okay, I've just spent a part of my life learning container technology. Okay, now containers, we get, no question about it, we get better utilization of hardware resources in containers. All right, and by the way, what Docker's gonna allow us to do is when we put, when we put the containers, when we throw them out of Docker uh, infrastructure, in the Docker Hub will be able to automated deployment methodology so that no human being will have to interact with the code. I mean, as you saw earlier, we want to get human beings as far out of the way as possible. We want to get human beings as far out of the way as possible. Because now, we're living in the age of big data. We're living in the age of artificial intelligence, real artificial now, I'm going to share a couple things, and this is, I'm going to bring it closer to you. I'm going to tell you some stuff about my, my family history. Don't worry. What did we say? Right, my grandmother was born in 1900. In her lifetime, she saw the first airplane go off. She died in 1993. She saw the first man on the So, in her lifetime, it took human. Mankind. Mankind took 10,000 years to get somebody off the ground. Uh, okay, I'll give you a hot air balloons. You got them, but you know, directed flight, hot air uh, airplanes. And it only took, after that, another 66 years to get them on the My father was born in 1927. The world he came into had radio. They really didn't listen to radio. They really didn't listen to all those serials and talk about it. There was no television. Television came into the life, really 1943, probably the war, so about 1950. So by that time, he was 23 years old. So television was functional in his life when he was 23. 
I was born in 1954. I touched my first mainframe computer in 1973. I said I, I said I didn't get into computer seven, but I started playing with mainframes in '73. Prior to that, in 1965, I went to the New York World's Fair. And at the New York World's Fair, there was this place called really the World of Tomorrow. And in here, they said, what will we, and what they did is they set up a television studio in Chicago and a television studio at the World's Fair. And they said, in the future, in the future, you will be able to have video conferences with somebody in Chicago. That was 1965. All right, so everything that has happened, that he predicted has happened, has happened. Now, here's something that's happened in my lifetime that how many, I'm going to ask a question, no, you don't have to answer. How many people here were born after 1975? Right. In my lifetime, up until a really Artificial intelligence did not touch me at all, not whatsoever. If I needed to get a bank bank loan, I went to the bank, I filled out an application, all right, and the bank officer approved it with the committee. If I needed to take a driving test, I went to the driving center and I got in the car and we So my wife, now that she's happy that she got this gas computer to go surf the internet, right? She says, look, we really need, I want to take a trip, but I want us to get air miles. I want us to get air miles. Okay. I said, okay, cool. She says, okay, get this, get this Capital One card. And so I go to this website and I put in my first name, my last name, my social security number, and I get a $30,000 line of credit. Now, why is this relevant? This is relevant because no human being gave me that line of credit. A machine. A machine was making consumer financial decisions based on something as big data out there. Big data out there. Now, anybody here, and I'm John, did a great job. I feel like um, this is a little cartoon we made. Okay. So we're going to have the Internet of Things. We're going to have all these things talking to one another. We're going to have all these things talking. Now, anybody here look at Jason, Jason LD, Jason, Jason Link Data? Jason LD, take a look at it. it Jason Link, it's the next extension of JSON. And Jason LD, you can put a lot of semantic be, semantic definition in, 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 the, in the structure, the JSON structure. And I looked at Jason LD and I said, this is great, but why do I need this? And it occurred to me, I don't need this. The machines need this. Other computers, other artificial, other intelligence need this information in order to understand does Bob Wrestling qualify for a $30,000 line of credit? Where has he gone? What does he do? What's his purchasing history? A, B, C, D, D. Now, you might say, Bob, what does this have to do with my pain and heartache and agony about containers? All right, here's the deal. The deal is I've been developing for a long time. I've seen more products come and go than I've seen come, right? And it's coming faster and faster and faster and faster. And somebody like Ray Kurzweil comes along and Kurzweil says this. Here's what Kurzweil says. In the future, we're going to have to fuse with robots. We're going to have to actually start becoming part of a robot. I already am. I'll let you know. I already am. Guess what? If you ever saw my handwriting, you'd have me shipped away. Uh, you think this is crazy? I can't write. I'm a professional writer with bad handwriting. I can't write unless that I've extended myself with that robot. Okay? We're going to get it. And now, when's the, anybody been up to the Getty Center? Right? There's a robot that takes us up there. We've extended ourselves with that robot to go to the top. And more and more, we're going to start becoming, extending ourselves with robots. That's the way it's going to, because we can't absorb it fast enough. We just can't. So, what does this mean? What does this mean? I've got two more stories and I'm going to bring it to a close because this is the little pivot I'm talking about. All right. Bill Joy. Bill Joy was the head scientist at Sun. And in 2000, he wrote an article in Wired Magazine, uh, I think it's August uh, 2000, 
right about that. It's called Why the Future Doesn't Need Us. This is uh, Joy's quote. Okay. If we can make all real decisions, we can't make any conjectures as a result. It is possible to guess how much this is not Ray Bradbury kids. This is a guy who created, was one of the people who made the internet. There really is something going on out there, and there's a good chance we'll never know. There's a good chance we'll never know. And someday, what's going to happen is, Bob, you don't really need to learn about your containers anymore. Don't matter. Somebody, Eric, I just want, we're having a discussion in line. Oh, what do you do? I write code, I write generators to, for generating code. That's a great ambition. It's a great ambition. We do that. We, we have the machines make the code that makes the machines. We do that. That's a profession. We'll get paid money for that. Now, am I being a Luddite? Am I saying, you know, go out, don't ever let the robots near you anymore? Don't, don't go off into the woods, be a Carl Hess, go off and go to, go to West Virginia, become a welder and only trade in welding materials. Get off the grid, get off the grid. Right. Okay, my granddaughter. My granddaughter, Eleanor, named after Eleanor Vacuum. My granddaughter, she just had her sixth birthday. Little kid's sixth birthday. Right? My granddaughter has cystic fibrosis. When I was 10 years old, a kid with cystic fibrosis was dead at the age of five. Dead at the age of five. She just had her sixth birthday. The day she was born, they caught her. Uh, they, they caught her. Because every human being in the state of Iowa has to have a blood test in the morning, and they can catch they caught the disease. It's one of the miracle diseases. Now the life expectancy is 50. By the time she's 30, it'll probably be 70. They might even figure out how to turn the gene off. And guess what? We'll just make it, it's like, all I gotta do is reboot the machine. If I reboot the machine, no more, no end, right? So here's what I'm, so here's the point. The point is we've all suffered this, we're gonna suffer machines. And I believe that, I'm happy to share my pain and agony. If for any other reason, no, you're not alone. I'm, I'm sad we have to all go through this. The other thing I'm saying is that we in this room, even, even to get close to being interested in this technology, even to get close to being interested in technology, we're running the show. We're running the show. For the foreseeable future, okay, within the next 10 years, we're still going to be writing the rules, for the most part, that the systems follow. Okay? That's it. I don't think something nefarious is going to happen immediately. All right. It will be interesting once we go to driverless vehicles, which is soon. We already have driverless trains. Most airplanes are, are the only time you a pilot interacts with an airplane is up and down. Every other time it's just it's, it's a robot. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I'm look, look, my cycle's over. Man. My cycle's over. I got one. I got another five years, and then I'm going to go make guitars for time. Right? Because I love working those little minutiae. I like touching that stuff. Right? Right? We here in this room, we run the show. There is nothing that cannot happen in the place you work, or the place I work, or the banking system, the flight system, the uh, culinary system, the food supply, the food chain, any of that stuff, unless we interact. We are the men, we are the women. We do that, that's our work, okay? So what I'm not suggesting is to go out and say, I'm getting off the grid, AI is unethical, don't do that. What I am asking you to remember is that the good news is my granddaughter will live a full life because those of us that understood the magnitude of artificial intelligence and big data and that we can actually start doing amazing things with it, get it. Get it. But don't, for a minute, please, be unaware that on that horizon out there, there is a distinct possibility that it won't, we won't matter. Look at the historical trends. If I told my grandmother, I could call up my granddaughter, who was supposed to be dead, last year, and talk to her by video phone. Anytime I feel like it, she'd think I'd eat my head exam. Any more than if she told her mother she would take a trip to Iowa. You think, you know, you think they get the command line.